Okay, I just got to get some noise here on this video. I think I'm, I'm fine now. Um, just need to know how to get it up there. Yep. <coughs> okay. Thank you, Miss Robin. Okay, let's. <coughs> ah, well, that might help. I know. That's cool. You can see it without going outside if you want. It's Now it is on. Uh, it is connected. It is connected. It is connected. I'm just going to try to read some how to make it up. Yeah, it's not you can see the cross dangling. If you just go that way, you can see yeah. it through the window. You don't have to go outside. Just keep going straight. Oh, I didn't push it hard enough. Now, are you going to behave? Oh, yes, you are. Okay, now let's try check the... Yes, I'm sorry. If I can, can I take some wire in for you? Okay, well, I'm sorry. My name is from the beginning. Okay. There we go. All right, now. What you do is you'll just toggle through with right. your number. And when it, when it actually gets to the end, right. it'll close. Okay. So and when you, I'm not sure where your video is in that process. Well, let's, um. <laughs> but I pulled up a browser with it, so. Let's do the video here real quick. So that's not showing, and it should show. You need to get out of your PowerPoint. Oh, is that it? Don't get out of the PowerPoint. Just get it. Ah, this is why I think we have multiple ones open. I'm going to go watch the cross first. There we go. There we go. Now. So, what it was is that we had it open twice. So okay, so when I want to. Okay, so don't trip and break my ankle. That's, yes, that would be, be most unfortunate. We would not, you would not come, you would never come back again. <laughs> <laughs> that would be our loss. All right. All right, then. I know. Oh, You can create a professional website okay, that that's, you got it. Just go to website. The best part is you can update it and keep it fresh whenever you want. I like changing up the background. It instantly gives okay, me a site. Alright, stop it. Uh, hey, you stop. Shut up. Yeah, just get the ad and just well, I wanna I don't wanna go into the video yet. Alright. But if you just hold you had uh, the No, uh, what did I do? Okay. Crazy here. It says 100. Yeah. Okay. And there's no wow, well, hey, this is dangerous. Well, Seriously. That's why I mean, that's not leadership. <laughs> yeah. In the halls. <coughs> Nothing I'm going to put yeah, a chair. Yeah, I went the other way and said, we're not going to have a dead end. I know. I do the same thing. All people come in this way. So okay. I, put up, I put up all the signs I can going, I hope this works. Because I'm straight okay. people okay. off the elevator. Well, we, got, yeah. we start, what, in 10 minutes? Yes. Okay. We got plenty of time. You ready? Go good? You have everything set? I think so. Okay. If you need something, I'll be around about 10 minutes out. I'll kind of pop in and say, hey, you've got about 10 minutes. Good. And then uh, everyone will get released. And then... Okay. Thank All right. Thank you so much. It is there. It's here. But it was cold. Now, I think. Rachel is the one with our office. She's got. Would it be okay? You're going to be able to see a lot better with these uh, off and the lights off. Yeah, that's fine. She's got them. She's got them. 
approach. <coughs> Okay, thank you. Others. Because they get more business when they close the pregnancy center. Every time a woman chooses life in a pregnancy center, an abortion doctor loses money. That's correct. So when you think of the hundreds of thousands of women who've chosen life and not abortion because of pregnancy centers, that translates into millions of dollars of lost income. Mm -hmm. Lost revenue. How long did that movie about that doctor stay on? Cause now. Cause now. It was in our town for quite a while, but yeah. very few people they went to watch it. it. But they there. put it on um, demand. You could have seen it on demand not too long ago. Yeah. Very few people in our town it's have watched it. It's on Amazon now. Even people from our, our church have said, oh, I don't want to go see that. It was very well done. Oh, yeah, it was really well, well done. done. What was the name of the uh, Called um, Gosnell. What, what was the okay. subtitle? Something Gosnell, or America's Greatest Serial Killer. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, yeah. the other thing about it is, there's absolutely no gory images yeah. at all. But it was far worse than seeing gory images because it left it to your imagination. Yeah. You know, and your imagination goes crazy when, you know, and, and so I thought that was really, really very effective the way they did it. They, um, there's a jury scene where they're, they're, uh, showing the jury the pictures of the babies. Oh, yes. And so you don't see the pictures, but you see, you see the, the, the guy reaction. going like this, and you see the jurors going, you know, mm -hmm. just the yeah. four. And so your mind is going crazy at what they're looking at. Yeah. And you can see it if you go to the website. You can see the actual picture. Yeah. Hmm. But tell me why. I don't understand the... I don't have an answer to the question. So we have Planned Parenthood videos. We have Mr. Gosnell, and uh, the numbers aren't changing on abortion. But people aren't going to see it. That's why. Well, people don't want to see it. No, That's correct. Didn't they also try to shut down was it Project Veritas or something? They went undercover and got them all saying. Hey, yeah, well, David Dolan has been indicted by the State Attorney General of California, 15 oh. felony counts. Yeah. yeah. Same Attorney General has tried to close down pregnancy. Uh, so. Yeah. Uh, so I, I always say, you know, someone who's honestly, they're, they're misguided, but they're honestly pro-choice. They're just misguided. Have, should have no problem whatsoever with pro-life pregnancy centers because pro-life pregnancy centers are just allowing women to choose life if you're for choice. Mm -hmm. that. Yeah, but, supposed to, but the pro people choice. who oppose us are not pro-choice, they're pro-abortion. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. That's all I want to talk about. Yeah. Oh, but it's wrapped up in a woman's right. Mm -hmm. A woman also has a right to choose life, doesn't she? Mm -hmm. So why wouldn't you support, support services that empower her to choose life? Yeah. If you're pro-choice. Mm -hmm. That's what I always say. Because women's right has become a political fight. How dare you not let me do what I choose? Mm -hmm. oh, make sure I get this thing right in here. <laughs> so we don't start fumbling around. One of Gosnell's clinics is right near our church, and they found dozens of babies. You can look at Elton, Maryland, and see dozens of full-term babies were found in freezers and all kinds of stuff in our town. And that same abortion clinic has been closed down, and now it's a pregnancy health center. Oh, so, wonderful. Yeah. Oh, great. Where's everybody from? From the northern neck of Virginia. Okay. And your name is? Joan Blackson. Hi, Joan. Hi. And Esther from Clayton, Delaware. And Joan and Esther and Virginia and Delaware. I'm Jesse. I live on Long Island. Joan, oh, Esther, and Jesse. Jesse. Mm -hmm. I live in Lewis, Delaware. Joan and Esther. Jesse and Vern. Tony from Tallahassee, Florida. Mm. Oh, wait. Mm. Good. This is Mary Lynn, and I'm right here from this church. And I know you because you knew Linda Perry. Knew? Does it pass tense? Did she pass on? How long ago? Oh. 
Yeah, I remember she was fighting cancer. I knew that. Yeah. Um, she found a, did she found <coughs> Christian Action Council? No, she was an early um, staff. You know. But she founded the CIS Pregnancy Center. So she passed away in October. Yeah. Yeah, she battled cancer for like 10 years. She did. Yeah. Yeah, she's with the Lord. I she's happy. <laughs> <laughs> she is pain free. Wow. All right, Nick. Awesome. Yeah. Kathy Charmariello, Nick's mom, Tony's husband from Tallahassee. Scott Bill, I'm from the Forest Hill Bay, which is about 25 miles northeast of Baltimore. Mm -hmm. My name's Jay. I'm about. Ten miles from you. <laughs> Five. Five miles. Yeah. Absolutely. Wow. Well, I guess we got five more minutes. And where are you? Where are you? I'm from Fredericksburg, Virginia. <coughs> I'll wait till we formally start, and I'll give a full introduction. But um, Fredericksburg, Virginia, the um, birthplace of America. George Washington grew up there. James Monroe practiced law there. James Madison, about five miles down the road in Orange County. What are you trying to say? <laughs> <laughs> just, just give me the facts, man. Give me the facts. Corporate Bishop Murdoch. Corporate Bishop Murdoch in for New England. You guys can kind of discuss yeah. it. <laughs> Boston, yeah. Boston could come in a close second, maybe. Yeah. 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 Yeah that the Virginians did come for uh, financial gain and the first people of okay, you're right on that. Baltimore came for religious that, You're absolutely right on that. The, the Jamestown so, settlement where people thought they were going to get rich yeah. and uh, they all all died away in the winter. Yeah. And the pilgrims uh, came to Plymouth Rock for religious freedom. Did you ever, have you read The Light and the Glory by Peter Marshall Jr.? That is excellent. It starts and gives the whole facts, not warts and all. Yeah. It's a good book. Yeah. Okay, so help me. We're supposed to start at ten, or one fifty, and end at two thirty-five. Is that it? Yes. Yeah. If you want to start now. Let, let's okay, let's go ahead. Okay. <coughs> Excuse me. Okay. Hi, I'm Tom Glessner. I am the uh, president of the National Institute of Family and Life Advocates, NIFLA, N-I-F-L-A. We are a legal network of uh, fifteen hundred pro-life. Pregnancy centers around the country, and yes, I am a lawyer. And um, of our members, 1,200 are medical clinics uh, providing ultrasound and certain medical services to women who are considering abortion. Uh, NIFLA is, has trained these centers in the how to go medical, how to be licensed clinics, in the <coughs> legal and medical twos of um, how tos of ultrasound, which is a primary tool we use that will help a mother choose life. We've trained almost 5,000 uh, healthcare professionals now, nurses, doctors, physicians, assistants in the use of ultrasound. Uh, we provide legal services. Uh, our, our mission is to empower pregnancy centers to stay the course and to uh, be able to operate in such a manner that uh, they can grow and expand and help mothers choose life. <coughs> so, as I said, in 1982, Planned Parenthood of uh, New York uh, entered into a plan and a plot and a conspiracy, so to speak, to <coughs> actually smear, slander, close down the work of pro-life pregnancy centers. So they meet and they launch this national campaign, and uh, in the campaign their mantra is, pro-life pregnancy centers are bogus clinics, bogus clinics, now it's fake clinics, I think they've taken the word fake from President Trump. <coughs> So now the fake clinics, they lie to women about abortion, they uh, give misinformation about abortion, they illegally practice medicine, um, they're untrained, uh, non-professional uh, volunteers who don't know what they're talking about essentially, and they deceptively advertise. They advertise in a way that make women think that if they come to them they'll get an abortion. Um, all of that is totally false, of course, and it's been, but it's been promoted so much over the years that many people believe it is true. NIFLA was started in 1992, it's going on 26 years now, uh, to be a legal organization to help these pregnancy centers combat that and also to help them 
operate in a legally proper way. You know, you, you don't know what you don't know. So when mistakes are made, it's not because you're intending to make mistakes or intending to do anything wrong. You just don't know. Um, so we, we do legal audits, we do board trainings, we do, um, uh, I speak at a lot of banquets, I, I, I do a lot of uh, trainings for centers around the country um, in order to get them operating properly and one of the major things we do of course is to train them in how to become a licensed medical clinic under the laws so that they can be licensed clinics. They're not bogus, they are licensed clinics. Um, <clears throat> Planned Parenthood's uh, campaign is just a, a religious fact for them that pregnancy centers are bogus, deceptive, and need to be closed down. Doesn't matter what we do, say, or, or uh, act, as long as we don't refer for abortion or do abortions, then we're bogus to them. <clears throat> so over the years, we have fought legislative attempts in many, many uh, states to that if the, the bills had passed, they would have not only hampered the operation of pregnancy centers, but in fact could have closed many of them down. We've been really successful in fighting these in court up until 2015 when, in fact, the state of California passed a Reproductive Fact Act. And that law mandates <coughs> that pro-life pregnancy medical clinics post a sign in their waiting area, a 22-point font, that would advise women, they number one, they have a right to a state-funded abortion, which they do in California, <coughs> and also a phone number to call to get that abortion started. Now in 2016, we filed suit against the state of California, sought a, a, a preliminary injunction and then a permanent injunction because we strongly believe the law is unconstitutional. It is. We'll get into that in a minute. Um, Hawaii followed suit with a similar law. The difference in Hawaii was that one of the pregnancy centers in Hawaii operates inside the walls of a church, the Calvary Chapel of Pearl Harbor. And therefore, the law means that the church has to post the sign in its narthex when people come in, a sign advising women they have a right to a state-funded abortion, and here's a phone number to call. Um, then Illinois followed suit with their law in uh, 2017, <coughs> uh, advising or, or mandating that physicians must refer for abortion regardless of their moral objections to it. And if the physicians do not refer, um, they uh, could lose their license to practice. Now, to be a medical clinic in all states, you have to have a licensed physician supervising services. So for Illinois to mandate that all physicians must refer for abortion immediately makes the pro-life pregnancy medical clinics, which there are 58 in Illinois, abortion referral agencies. So we sued the state of Illinois. We got a preliminary injunction on that law. The law, that case is still pending. Um, Nithla versus Becerra came down. We'll get into that. And based on Nithla versus Becerra, uh, lots of great stuff has been happening. So let's start. <coughs> By the way, that picture. All right. <coughs> It'll go back. <coughs> uh, we're coming out of the Supreme Court on, on uh, March 26th of this year. And we had um, the first day of spring. It was freezing rain and snow. <laughs> We had about 400 people supporting us show up, and they got there as early as 5 in the morning. Yeah. Um, and so I'm cuddled up nice and cozy in a warm courtroom, <coughs> and the court argument starts at 10, and then there it is, the picture. The court oh, argument starts at 10, and um, so it, we're over at 11. So it's 11 o'clock there. We're coming out of the court, and the crowd just cheers like it's, a touchdown or something. So if you notice, that's me yeah. doing that. Well, guess what? Just count how long it takes to do that. 1,001, 1,000, less than two seconds. Somebody snapped that picture with a cell phone right at me. So I found that so incredible on why we're losing signal. <laughs> <coughs> Just as we're getting into this. So, okay, good. So, that was a big day. Let me play you a video taken on that day. The issue before the court is can the government be empowered 
to force a charitable faith-based nonprofit, or for, for that matter, any group, to speak a message with which they fundamentally disagree. I mean, because this is really about an industry <coughs> to shut down its opponents. It's about the freedom to say what you think. Absolutely. Free, free, because of your prayers, because of your hard work, because this is the human rights struggle of our time. Say, give free speech life, which is our goal today. I'm here because I support life and I support freedom of speech. This is a, uh, a battle really for the soul of our country. Thumbs up. This law is allowed to happen. The very heart and soul of the First Amendment will be gone. Nobody should be compelled to speak a message with which they fundamentally disagree. The best part of what we do at ADF is to be able to stand alongside organizations <coughs> like NIFWA and individuals who want to and are being a voice for life. We're honored to serve you. We pray God's blessing upon you. God bless the Supreme Court and God bless America. You see, you stand for something much bigger than the state of California here. You stand for something that is at the heart and soul of our nation. And the future and destiny of our nation is due to heroes like you because of your work. Love and mercy and justice flow like a river across this country, creating a culture of life. And one day, your work will be acknowledged and you will hear those words, well done my good and faithful servants. Get out of this and go to the power. The bottom is that exit now. Down here. Oh, there it goes. Sorry. Got it. Get out of that. and protecting brings the sinners. Let's talk about the history of this campaign for a minute. I've already referenced it a little bit. So in 1982, Planned Parenthood of New York plans a national campaign. They want to slander pro-life centers as bogus clinics. And uh, this national PR campaign proceeds. We saw in the mid-1980s that lawsuits were filed against pregnancy centers. One major lawsuit was filed in California against the Right to Life League Center. Um, other lawsuits were filed. We lost the one against the, the Right to Life League Center, by the way. And it was one of those cases that uh, at the time, and this was in the early or mid-80s, at the time the case came down, um, I was up in Seattle at that time, and I was the chairman of our, our board of directors of the Pregnancy Center in Seattle. <coughs> and this lawsuit came down, and the court ruled that pregnancy centers that are giving pregnancy tests are illegally practicing medicine. That only a doctor can give out a pregnancy test and read the results. That's a diagnostic procedure and only a physician can do that. <coughs> and so we immediately kind of thought, gee whiz, what are we going to do now? They're going to close this down. Um, but I can say now, I look back on that particular lawsuit with a great deal of fondness and thankfulness for the result. Because, number one, the result was correct reading of the law. Total correct reading of the law. 
Number two, it forced us to kind of sit back and see what we're doing and how we're doing things. Mm -hmm. So what resulted from that lawsuit was this movement of pregnancy centers to become medical clinics, become licensed clinics beginning in California. <coughs> um, as licensed clinics, we, that argument where illegally practicing medicine is gone. But we then discovered something, and this is critical. As licensed medical clinics, we can begin using ultrasound. Now this is the mid 80s. Ultrasound is really far, far exceeded what it was doing back in the 80s. <clears throat> but we can begin to use ultrasound to confirm a pregnancy with a mother, and she could see the image of the baby on the screen. Uh, how powerful is that tool? Well, our stats today indicate that a center that's not medical will see about 20 to 25 percent of their clientele choose life. A center that is medical and using ultrasound and the mother gets to see the image, that, that number jumps up to 90 percent. 90 percent. <clears throat> well, sympathetic attorneys generals in other states, Ohio, New York, and others began to investigate bogus clinics wanted to uh, do some things to them to close them down. So we faced that in the 80s. <clears throat> in the 90s, there were congressional hearings into the bogus clinics launched by a man who's now Senator of Oregon who's a congressman, Congressman Ron White. He teamed up with the abortion industry and Planned Parenthood to launch investigations into these bogus clinics that are deceiving women and harming women all over the country with their lies and their misinformation. <clears throat> when that um, hearing was set up, I'm at that time the president of the Christian Action Council, which is now CareNet, and um, I called Congressman Wayne's office. Now, we had 450 pro-life pregnancy centers affiliated with us at that time. And I called Congressman Wayne's office and told them who I was, I said, we'd like to come and testify at your hearing. I was told that, no, you're not going to be able to do so because <clears throat> this is Congressman Wyden's agenda and he's determined who he's going to call. Well, I got really upset about that, so I, I went to the Washington Times and they mm -hmm. printed a report, a front page article on it that we're being shut out. And on the morning of the hearings now, the, the other side had done a lot of uh, PR, it was Good Morning America, Congress, Congressman Wyden was on being interviewed, and he was asked, so how come pro-life centers, uh, pro centers aren't invited to speak and testify? And he says, because we don't know who they are. Because we, we have no clue who these people are operating these bogus clinics. We'd love to have them come, but we don't know how to even contact them. Oh, oh. He lied, but you know, maybe he didn't lie. Maybe he just was misinformed. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, congressmen don't lie. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> so, um, New York, 2002, a campaign under that uh, exemplar of moral virtue, <laughs> Attorney General Elliot Spitzer. Uh, he, he campaigned to the office promising to close down bogus abortion clinics. And he sets up his Office of Reproductive Rights. Uh, in the Attorney General's office. And their job is to launch this campaign to close down uh, pro-life centers. So he began to subpoena uh, centers all around the state, a subpoena asking for virtually every piece of paper, scrap paper that's ever been produced in 20 years in their office, all their files. Um, so we immediately resisted. We got a law firm in New York to give us some pro bono work. <clears throat> and Mr. Spitzer, who had visions of being governor of New York one day, and he eventually did get elected as governor, realized he made a big, big miscalculation politically. Because you see, if you want to get elected governor of New York, you better, better be worried about what the Catholic parishes in New York City mm -hmm. think about you. And so these Catholic parishes that on Respect Life Sunday are collecting diapers and baby clothes and money for pregnancy centers aren't too happy with him calling these centers bogus and deceptive and all that. <clears throat> so you realize he made a political miscalculation. So what he did was he um, entered into one settlement with a birthright in upstate New York and declared victory and pulled out. So nothing really happened there. But then there are state legislative attempts in Oregon three times. 
Washington, Jutas, Maryland, Virginia, and bills that have been filed in numerous states. These these legislative attempts centered around forcing centers to post signs in their uh, in their waiting areas, uh, stating various things, but essentially advising centers in a negative way of who we are, and you realize you're not coming to a real medical clinic, and therefore be advised that uh, you might be deceived, basically like that. Now, some people, you know, if you read some of the, the um, language that was being required to be posted, um, just on its face it wouldn't seem to be too bad. Um, but here's the thing. Um, I, I say, politically, it's Yellow Star of David. Now, in Nazi Germany, they required Jews to wear a Yellow Star of David, identifying who they are. So what's the problem with that? They are Jewish. Are you ashamed of it or something? You know, you're ashamed to tell people you're Jewish? What's the problem with that? That's what they would say. Well, we know what the problem was. This was a, a, a yellow star to be worn as a badge of shame in the midst of a campaign, a propaganda campaign, to dehumanize them and to create a public uh, attitude towards them in a very negative way. Well, that's the same thing here. This is all part of a public campaign about bogus clinics, lying to women, deceiving women, uh, pretending they're abortion clinics when they're not. So that's what these bills would do. So Oregon tried it three times. Now, Oregon is a very, very liberal, pro-abortion, pro-Planned Parenthood state. And we rallied and got the bills defeated in that state. <clears throat> Washington the same. Very pro, I'm from originally from the state of Washington. Very pro-abortion, pro-Planned Parenthood state. Uh, we again defeated those attempts. Maryland, the same thing. I went to the hearing in, in the state senate in Maryland, and um, it was really clear what was going on. The other side had all their hysterical testimony. They had an abortion doctor come in and tell uh, the legislators how terrible we were. And can you imagine the credibility? <clears throat> what credibility would a tobacco company executive have? If they were testifying about how these anti-smoking groups were deceptive and lying, oh, how much credibility there? So here you have Planned Parenthood getting federal dollars, the abortion industry, people with a financial interest in this testifying as if they're credible witnesses. What are Princey says? They're for the most part well, they're all nonprofit. Most of them are woefully underf underfunded, primarily staffed by volunteers, a few paid staff people. The paid staff people work 80 hours a week at like $2.50 an hour, something like that, because that's all they can afford to pay. <clears throat> so what's their financial incentive here? There is none. Um, so in Maryland, after the hearing, I, I talked to the state, the, the chairman of the committee, <clears throat> a really pretty decent guy. He's pro-abortion, he's um, pro Planned Parenthood. Nice guy. Uh, he says to me, he says, yeah, between you and me, this bill's going in my, under the bottom of my pile on the desk and not seeing the light of day. See, he had visited the Prancy Center in his community and he, know, he knew all this stuff being said about him wasn't true. You know? So um, that bill died. Virginia had an attempt, it died. And bills filed in other states have all died in committee. So. Then the other side decides, okay, well, we're, we're not having a good uh, accomplishing a lot in the state level, so why don't we go to municipalities? So they are successful in municipalities. In Baltimore, Montgomery County, Maryland, New York City, Austin, Texas, San Francisco, Hartford, Connecticut, Seattle, King County, Washington, municipal ordinances are passed that are the same as the, the state bills, only it would only apply to, like into the county or city. And these are passed by these municipalities. <clears throat> so we sue and we get the ordinance uh, declared unconstitutional in Baltimore, Montgomery County, New York City, Austin, Texas. Uh, partially declared unconstitutional in San Francisco, but now because of NIFLA versus Becerra, that's going to go. Hartford, Connecticut passed one in the last year that's going nowhere. They said they're not enforcing it. And San Joaquin County was even more ridiculous. <clears throat> it doesn't apply to anybody in the county. The, the, the ordinance specifically exempts licensed medical clinics and the only pregnancy centers in Seattle King County are licensed medical clinics. So what was even the issue? Why did we waste public time to do this? It was all propaganda. 
<clears throat> so we're winning. And I'm thinking, huh, I'm getting kind of a big head here, thinking they can't beat us. Uh, the reason we were winning was the federal court decisions all agreed that these municipal ordinances violate the constitutional protection of free speech because they compel pregnancy centers to speech, speak a government preferred message. You know, you have the right of free speech in the Constitution. It's, it is a right to speak. It is also a right to not be compelled to speak a message with which you disagree. It is a right not to be forced by the government to say something that violates your conscience. And so the court found that these, uh, all these ordinances did that and were unconstitutional. Ah, then came California. The Reproductive Fact Act. The mandate, pro-life pregnancy medical clinics must post a sign in 22 point font advertising the availability of abortion as a state funded service with a phone number. A phone number to call to schedule an abortion consultation. So a woman pretends it's a pregnancy center, a woman walks in, the, the law said it has to be in a conspicuous place. First thing she sees on the wall is attention, you have a right to a state funded abortion, here's a phone number to call for more information and schedule an abortion. They're forcing them to be abortion referral agencies. <coughs> Non-medical centers were required to post a sign in 48 point font. Um, I think that's about 48 point font up there. I'm, I'm not sure. So look how big that would be. 48 point font saying that they're not medical and do not have medical staff uh, on site. The sign must be posted in all of the, uh, the sign must be posted in all of its advertising, including website. It must be on all primary in all primary languages spoken in the community. So thirteen languages. Thirteen yeah, yeah, in Los Angeles thirteen languages. So forty eight point five sign and thirteen languages. Imagine what that looked like. You wallpaper your wall. Mm -hmm. Now so people say, Well what's wrong with that? Isn't that a true statement? It's a yellow star of David, it's what it is. And it's compelling speech and it's not necessary because we train all our pregnancy centers to say specifically in their intake and in their advertising, we do not refer for abortion or, or provide abortion. It's not necessary. There's no, no harm they identified that this uh, corrects. The penalty for non-compliance is $500 fine for the first incident, $1,000 fine for each incident thereafter. So essentially what would happen would be they'd come in, they'd give you a fine, you don't correct it, because our centers aren't going to obey this. They'll, they'll just rip up the ticket. Mm -hmm. uh, they'll keep doing it until the fines are so heavy they'll levy and close you down. And that was the purpose of the law. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so we filed suit, Ninth Circuit Federal District Court, January 2016. Our motion for a preliminary injunction was denied by the trial court. So we appealed to the Court of Appeals. That was also denied. We appealed to the Supreme Court of the United States. Now. The Supreme Court has 8,000 petitions a year filed with it for a hearing. They hear less, they uh, agree to hear less than 100. So it's about a 1% chance mathematically we're going to get there. Um, I was pretty confident we we're going to get there for a number of reasons. Uh, but, you know, it wasn't a sure thing. They, they decided in November. 2017, they're going to hear the case. In the meantime, Hawaii passes their law, and this impacts the Calvary Chapel of Pearl Harbor. Uh, so even though this was technically a free speech case, it certainly is a freedom of religion case as well. Churches, and there are churches all over the country that house pregnancy citizens inside. So. If this law is upheld and other states adopted, all these churches would be under it. Um, we filed suit. Illinois, they passed their law that mandates physicians refer for abortion. We filed suit there. We got a preliminary injunction in that case. Hawaii, uh, when the court decided to hear the California case, the Hawaii courts put everything on hold until uh, the California decision came down. Nethaverse versus Becerra, argument, March 20th, 2018, history is made. There I am, thumbs up, thumbs up. 
That's a quote from Benjamin Franklin down there that we photoshopped in on free speech. That was quite a day. June 26, 2018, Supreme Court gives victory to pregnancy centers. Justice Clarence Thomas writes the opinion in a 5-4 decision. I was stunned that it was 5-4. I mean, it really was. I thought this is a no-brainer. This is a no-brainer. 5-4. That shows you how close we are to going over the edge. Mm -hmm. uh, now, I'm, I'm sitting in the court here. I, I live in Fredericksburg, Virginia, and you don't you don't know when a case is coming down. You just got to kind of guess and be there when it comes down. And so, going into the last week of the uh, court hearing, the last two weeks, the case hadn't come down, so I started going into the court every day. Uh, so, Fredericksburg, Virginia, I'm up at 5:30 to the train station at 6:30. I'm uh, to Union Station at 7:30 grab a quick bite to eat and grab a cab to get over to the court at 8 o'clock and walk in. I'm a, a U.S. A, a Supreme Court bar member, so I, I'm the, I, but I'm there early and I'm first in line and I'm sitting there all alone in this courtroom for a while. I got to know the clerks really well, by the way, very nice people. So I come in and uh, I say, hey, Mr. Blesser, good morning. Hope it comes down for you today. No, it's like that. It's like that real friendly. Got a real friendly with one of the security guards was in the court because I'd be sitting in the court all alone, sitting there, and they, oh, good morning, sir. How are you? Mm -hmm. So the day it comes down, um, that's happening, and I'm sure this is the next to last day of the term. And, and some told me it's coming down today. So I'm in there, I'm sitting in the front row of the court, and I'm looking around. Have, have, how many here have been to the Supreme Court? No. Oh my, you really need to just take a tour. It's, it's really something. So, I'm sitting in the front row of the Supreme Court and justices are going to come in at 10. I'm going to be, I'm about as close to them as I am to you back there, you know, in my seat. That's how close I am. And it hit me what was going on here and I was just absolutely overcome with emotion. Uh, it hit me. I am the only lawyer in the whole world right now, in the whole world, sitting in this spot in the most powerful court in the country, maybe the world, and in a few minutes they're going to deliver a decision that I've been a part of that's going to impact the future of the nation. And I was just like, I was overwhelmed. So I, I just kind of went like this. And I don't know what I look like, but a security guard saw me do that, and he comes over. Are you okay, sir? Are you okay? Mm -hmm. I said, no, I'm fine. Thank you. Mm -hmm. A few minutes later, people started coming in. So they come in, and Justice Clarence Thomas, they announced he wrote the opinion. Now, he said something that scared me, because I knew we won, but he said, um, Justice Kennedy has filed a concurring opinion joined by Justice this is Robert Alito, Robert Alito and Gorsuch. So that's a concurring opinion. Four justices sign on to a concurring opinion. Now, the way it works is you have a majority opinion, you gotta have five votes for the result. But if a justice agrees with the result but disagrees with the reasoning, they can they can uh, uh, write what we call a concurring opinion. And so sometimes this gets very confusing because you know what the result is, but you're not sure of the reasoning behind it because you have all these concurring opinions, and then there's the the formal opinion of the court. So when he says this, I'm going, I'm not sure it's time to celebrate yet, because I don't know exactly what this means other than we won something. I liked what I heard from Thomas, but we, I leave the court, I meet a friend of mine, Kristen, from Alliance Defending Freedom, and she had the opinion, she didn't, wasn't in the court, she had the opinion, got from the court's office, and I told her I was concerned, and she says, don't be concerned, the, the concurring opinion is so beautifully written it goes beyond even what the, the Thomas majority opinion does. Um, and I'll talk about that in a minute. <coughs> Justices Breyer, Ginsburg, Kagan, and Sotomayor all dissent. Okay, so what's the essence of the majority opinion? Here are the takeaways. California's Reproductive Fact Act is compelled speech and as such is an unconstitutional violation of the free speech rights of pregnancy centers. Strict scrutiny, the highest standard of judicial, judicial review, applies when determining if the state of California can regulate the speech of pregnancy centers. 
To win, California must show that it has a compelling interest to regulate the speech and that in doing so it has used the least restrictive means possible. California simply failed to meet the standard of judicial review. Now basically what it means is in, in the law, okay, so you have a right of free speech. Can the government come, uh, restrict your free speech? Well, in certain cases it can. In the area of commercial speech, the government can say you can't deceptively advertise or restrict your speech. Um, you know, the old adage out of the Supreme Court decision, you can't yell fire in a crowded theater. Uh, the government can restrict time, place, reasonable restrictions on that. You can't be in a hospital zone with a bullhorn screaming your message into the operating room. Yeah, operating room. Okay. Well, that's restricting free speech. It's not restricting content there, but it's restricting where you can do it. Um, so it can to a certain degree. But California could not justify its actions. They argued that it has a right to direct the speech of medical professionals. That's what they said. We can regulate medical professionals and it's professional speech. Uh, such kinds of restrictions are allowed only if speech is commercial speech, dealing with the sale of goods and services. This was a really very important part of the decision because it goes far beyond the work of pregnancy centers. So, California was ready, had the votes to pass a law this, this last year, criminalizing what they call conversion therapy criminalizing, conversion therapy being a Christian counselor, a priest, or a pastor working with uh, a homosexual person and working with them and trying to get them to change their, their sexual orientation. Criminalize it. It would make your pastor, your priest a criminal. Mm -hmm. um, that bill was ready to pass, but because of Nifla versus Becerra, they pulled it. They said, we'll lose in federal court because we're compelling speech and we can't regulate the speech of professionals in that way. Mm -hmm. So it goes far beyond that, so we're really yeah. celebrating. California's Reproductive Fact Act is clearly content-based discrimination, meaning that it discriminates against pregnancy centers because it does not like the content of their message. So the government can't say, I don't like that message, you will not say this, you will say this. Mm -hmm. They can't do that. That's content-based. Now, the Kennedy concurrence, which was beautiful, goes further. Kennedy, in, in his concurrence, says, we agree with everything that Justice Thomas says. So when I saw that, I go, okay, we've got everybody on board with the majority opinion. But his concurrence goes further. He said the law is also a viewpoint discrimination, meaning that it discriminates against pregnancy centers because it does not like their viewpoint on abortion. So content discrimination is, I don't like that specific message, you will not say, you will say this. Viewpoint discrimination is, I don't like you and what you believe, therefore you will not say this. Okay, so that was pretty good. Yeah. Yeah. That was awesome. All right, the future. Well, injunctions will be entered against California. We've already got that, prohibiting it from enforcing the law. Laws in Hawaii and Illinois are certain to be enjoined. We already have our permanent injunction against Hawaii. Illinois is still, is still uh, up in the air, but we have a preliminary injunction there. And I just can't imagine why that law can, can withstand uh, scrutiny in light of the, the Senate case. Now, I did this uh, PowerPoint, obviously, before uh, our Kavanaugh hearings. What will the impact of the retirement of Justice Kennedy? What will it be? Well, we all, this was before he was confirmed. And I did this uh, to encourage people to get behind the nomination of Judge Kavanaugh. Uh, because nonprofits, while they can't endorse political candidates, they can uh, support and work for the nomination of, of judges. Um, I don't know about you, I was never more depressed than I've ever been over those Kavanaugh hearings. That was just the most wicked, evil thing imaginable. And um, we have become absolutely so, what can I say? depraved in our public discourse that to do that is unbelievable. Will he be a vote to reverse? We don't know. Why can't we fight Roe versus Wade? Because it's based on perjury. Because the ultimate say on it is we only there's only one place we can fight it and that's at the Supreme Court. And that's why the nomination is so important. Will Roe be reversed? If so, what's the impact? I guess that's how it ends here. Let me let me talk about that for a minute. <clears throat> so, 
I don't believe that this current court will reverse Roe versus Wade. I don't believe Justice Roberts will allow Roe versus Wade to be reversed um, on a 5-4 vote because it would be best 5-4. So we need at least one other justice. Now, I'm not sure they would reverse it anyway, but what I am hopeful for is this, that the current court and maybe one more justice will begin to uphold some things we need upheld. Let, let's stop here for a minute and ask ourselves. So what's, what is the result <coughs> excuse me, of Roe versus Wade being reversed? The day after Roe versus Wade is reversed in this uh, country, abortions will continue on as they are today. Nothing's, nothing's going to change. They can still have states can just... Right, and so ask them. yourself <laughs> ask yourself this. Depends on the state. Right? Depends on the state. Yeah. Okay, is the state of California ever going to outlaw abortion? No. They, they do about one-third of all the abortions anyway. Hmm. New York, Illinois, start picking off these big states. They're not going to do it. But what will happen, I don't think there's any state, even the most conservative pro-life states, that would actually uh, prohibit all abortions. I don't think so. We tried to uh, put, did our best in South Dakota and Louisiana, can't get it there. So you'll have some states that will adopt restrictions, other states, California most likely will find a right to abortion in their state constitution, and other states will. And what will happen will be Women in the states that have restricted it somehow will travel to states where right. it's not restricted. Well, that's what they did before. Right? That's what they did before. So my point is this. We want Roe versus Wade reversed. Absolutely. But let's not think that's the end of mm -hmm. the story. In fact, in many, in many cases, California, it's going to be worse. This is why the church has to be involved, and it's a cultural battle. Now, what I am hopeful for, though, on the legal front is this. Um, so, are you familiar with the heartbeat bill in Iowa? Anybody not familiar with that? It's a pain capable 20 weeks. Well, I'm even going further. The heartbeat bill, yeah. which would outlaw all abortions once a baby's heartbeat is, can Seven. be hurt. Well, that's three that's, weeks after yeah, conception. That, that virtually would end all abortions. True. Now, all surgical abortions, anyway. Now, I'm hope, and that case is working its way through the, the courts now. I'm hope, hopeful that the court would uphold that. And that could be a way out for Roberts, who doesn't want to be known as the justice who ended women's rights. So what the court would say would be, Roe versus Wade is still good law, but within the confines of Roe, uh, a state can pass a heartbeat bill. So that, in essence, would give states the ability, if they could, to end abortion in their states with a heartbeat bill. Now, would they? I don't know. The fact is, Roe gone just means the battle intensifies at state levels. And the real battle, the real battle, is of course a one of value and of churches. Why it's so absolutely critical that the work of pro-life centers... Ten minutes. Ten minutes? Okay, thank you. Um, the work of pro-life pregnancy centers continue and why we're in the battle to protect them. Because whether or not Roe is... Pa is, is, is uh, is reversed whether or not we outlaw abortion in the states, abortion is still going to happen. Therefore, the work of pro life pregnancy centers is more critical than ever. And how effective has their work been? <clears throat> well, in 1992, NIFLA started in 93, right after that. The estimated number of annual abortions by the Guttmacher Institute was about 1.6 million a year. The latest stats, which are almost four years old from 2015, indicate that the estimated number, annual number of abortions is 900,000. That's a horrible number, but do the math. 1.6 million down to 900,000 is almost having the number of abortions in a 26 year period. I believe the work and expansion of pro-life pregnancy centers is primarily responsible for that. They're in every community in the country uh, they are providing the services that, when I say, empower mothers to choose life. The use of medical services such as ultrasound, when a mother sees her baby on the screen, that's just unbelievable. So that's the work ahead of us. Um, I certainly want Roe versus Wade thrown out. 
Um, but I'm not going to declare victory when it's thrown out. I think the culture has been so polluted with an abortion mentality, and uh, abortion is going to continue. But you would see that they uh, were able to do that, but you'd see a greater decline, even though certain states, like especially states in the South, would be much more restricted. And that even though they, they could still have an abortion, like in other states, would definitely decrease the number of abortions. Oh, I, I agree. Yeah, I agree. Mm -hmm. But well, how many states in 1992 didn't have to show their abortion numbers? There's more now than there was back then. I, I don't know. There are more show. The, more the, states were able to show their well. The, the stats. states that don't re, don't report are mm -hmm. California, California uh, yeah. New Hampshire. Uh, there's like four states that don't report. California, New Hampshire. I, I got to get the other two. Other two are pretty insignificant. California is the big one. Yes. You know. They don't report. The, no, they, they don't they report. report. They don't report. So when you get the CDC um, statistics, Centers for Disease Control, they actually came out and said uh, it's about 630,000 abortions in 2015, but California and these states didn't report, so they say this is 70% of what the total abortions would be. So you do the math and that works out to about 900,000 abortions, which again compared to 1.6 million is quite a drop. Other comments or questions? Do you know what? We also, this is kind of a funny thing, but if we have fewer people in, this, in the United States, I don't know if we do, then there are going to be fewer abortions because there's a lower population. Fewer women of childbearing yeah, years. Yeah, yeah. And they're talking now about the childbearing is, like you said, not even re, re, uh, reducing, I mean, or adding to your own population, I mean your own family. The demographics. Is yeah. So if fewer people are alive, then there are going to be fewer abortions percentage-wise. You know. New York City had 36,000 abortions last year. That's more than were born. That's yeah. more babies than were born. So, so yeah. yeah. So, so, in, so 20 years, yeah. in 20 yeah. years, uh, that'll sound like a reduction, but it's just because there are fewer people. Well, there's a very good book out by Pat Buchanan called The Death of America. Yeah. And he just um, uses demographic information to project to the year 2050. Um, in the year 2050, the demographics show that our population mm -hmm. will be very, very aged. And the, the thing that uh, frightens people is who's filling that gap that's happening in Europe, for instance. Well, Islam, Islamic families are having eight, nine children. Yeah, and, uh, they just win by. That, well, and you know what? They know that too. They know that too. So they, 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 uh, they, they're very what? confident in the ultimate Islamization of the world because of the demographics. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. I should, you were talking about the heartbeat bill, and with the current makeup of the court, so in a bill that say that was ruled favorably. Um, with it being a 5 4 majority versus if there's in time some more change in the court, just assuming that there would be positive change, um, would it be better to have that go through with a stronger majority, less likely to be overruled down the road? Or That's hard to say. I mean, you, you always want more than a 5 4 decision, but 5 4 decision is. The 5 4s are more, more vulnerable to being overturned than stronger. Is that a Well, that seems logical, but it's not really the, you know, there's plenty of 5-4 decisions that are holding firm over years and years and years. So um, that's logical, but I'm not sure it's true. That's what I was thinking. I wish it was 7-2, not 5-4. We thought it would be 7-2, but 5-4 uh, and still a win. You know, and it's, it's, it's the precedent of the court. Yeah. I thought I heard Judge Kavanaugh when he was in his hearing say that Roe versus Wade was established law, so yes. therefore he wasn't inclined to overturn it. Mm -hmm. I don't recall his exact language there. Something yeah, I mean, like it that. was such a circus anyway. I think he, f I think yeah. it was fudged and yeah. nothing could be right either way. Yeah. But I mean, yeah. it would seem to me he that if, if, if we had the Dred Scott decision, which was terrible law, mm -hmm. that was overturned. That was Supreme Court. Actually, it wasn't overturned by the Supreme well, Court. Yeah. Well, it was overturned by 700,000 deaths of Americans right. in the and Civil War. Plessy, Plessy versus Ferguson, which was terrible law, which was overturned. Brown so for, for them to say that well, we don't overturn 
Supreme Court, it's like etched in stone. Yeah. It's it, it just he was in a political situation. I didn't I didn't take much credence in anything he said about it because. Well, didn't he just vote though not to hear a case? He did, which was disappointing. What what case was that? Then? I'm trying to remember what that was. It was a review of. Uh, well, just a couple of weeks ago. Yeah. And they, yeah. they made a passing thing about it on the news. Yeah. And I was like, wait a minute. He just. He and Roberts voted not to hear. I'm trying to remember what that was. It wasn't a case that was central to the holding of Roe. And a lot of, lot of, there's a lot of reasons why a, a justice may vote not to hear a case. Uh, you just can't read into that, that <clears throat> their, their opinion on the issue. But I was disappointed. I, I'll be honest, I don't, I don't, I suspect Justice Roberts and Justice Kavanaugh as possibly not being with us when, mm -hmm. when they're needed. Mm -hmm. But I, we don't know that. Justices often change over time and raise people that were grumpy to change, too. Yeah, but they always change in the wrong direction. Yeah, I, yeah. I know. Kennedy, <laughs> Kennedy has always been a waffler, hasn't he? Uh, when I came to Washington, D.C. in 1987, the first battle we faced was the nomination of Justice Kennedy to the court. The very first political battle I got involved in. All the things that were said about Kavanaugh were said about Kennedy. It wasn't as vicious and nasty, but it was tough. He's going to be the fifth vote to overturn Roe. Everything you're like Kavanaugh mm -hmm. was there, mm -hmm. um, and so I was sitting in the front row of the court in 1992, in the Planned Parenthood versus Casey decision where we anticipated reversing Roe, and Kennedy voted the wrong way. He backstabbed us. Mm -hmm. um, did, did Kavanaugh clerk for Kennedy? He did. Yes, he did. So. Mm -hmm. You know, you never know. Roberts voted the ridiculous ruling that upheld Obamacare. Oh, yeah. That and he, re he voted saying it was a tax. Wait, Therefore, they said Congress it wasn't. Could, they said it wasn't. <laughs> and it was that, that was never even argued at an oral argument. And then he just goes on and says, well, it, it can be done under the Congress's power of taxation. It, it says specifically in the bill it's not a tax. Yeah. So uh, I don't trust Roberts. We don't know. We don't know the future, but that's why I'm going to say, let's not put so much hope in the reversal of Roe yeah, because yeah. we have to understand reversal of Roe doesn't mean a lot as yeah. far as abortions. Now, I, I, think, uh, I think there's a lot to be done in, in laws that restrict abortion and make right. it more difficult and that this court would undoubtedly, hopefully, uphold most of those laws, particularly I think of the heartbeat bill. Uh, the, the the pain capable act which hasn't passed yet um, it up. and we keep yeah. bringing it up well with this congress it's gone because the democrats yeah. won the house the euthanasia bill is this but that, that i would that, uh, the indiana law that it's signed is coming up yeah. so there there are some hopeful th things uh, but the reversal of roe whether it happens or not i don't think is going to impact really the future the near future in a way of whether abortion continues I think our problem is that a baby hasn't been considered a person. Everybody, every person is entitled to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, but they don't consider a baby a person. Yeah. So that's, the, that's the problem. That's it. And I don't even think this court would find personhood on an unborn child. That's right. Even uh, Justice Scalia, who always ruled in our favor, who to Justice Scalia, this was simply a state issue. States have the power to restrict it, prohibit it. The federal government doesn't. That, that was his position. He was a great guy, though. Anything else? I guess we're a little over time here, so. If your pregnancy center is associated with a church, can they, I, I was told they can't get any kind of federal or state funding. I'm working with a pregnancy center that's been in business for 31 years. Which one? You can't count me. Pregnancy crisis center in Dover, Delaware. Dover, Delaware? They have not had one cent of federal or state right. money in 31 years. And they said they can't get it because they're affiliated with the Catholic Church there. They're better off. Well, yeah, well, my point, yeah, yeah I, I, I yeah, think we better think twice that. before we get, get yeah. federal funds. Right. Right. Yeah. Okay, I guess it's time. So what time is the next one? Uh, yeah, the pregnancy 3 o'clock?
Yeah. Is the Life Choices Center in Binghamton, New York, associated with your group? I don't know. I have to look up. 